Hello everyone and welcome to Slash Home Daily for April 2nd, 2019. This is Slash Home Editor-in-Chief Peter Soda and joining me on today's podcast is Slash Film Senior Writer Ben Pearson. Hey, what's going on? So we are here in Las Vegas for what they call CinemaCon. It used to be called Show West. This is a, a convention where movie theater exhibitors gather to see presentations from the major studios with their upcoming slates for the next year plus. And this week we're going to be doing podcasts and some coverage on the site from these presentations. This morning we got to see the presentation from STX Studios, or Films, STX rather. STX Films, Films. Yes. And uh, this is a new, uh, a, a rather relatively, compared to the other studios, mm-hmm. relatively new studio. They came about four or five years ago, um, and they've produced like 27, 26, 27 films thus far. Uh, do, do you, are you a fan of any of the STX films? We were looking at this uh, before we started recording, and Molly's Game is an STX movie. That's one of the very few films of theirs that I've liked. But, you know, it they are a studio or a company that produces mid-budget stuff centered around movie stars but they also did the edge of the 17 oh yeah edge of 17 that was yeah. that was a great one too the the very underseen highly uh Haley stanfeld uh high school uh romantic comedy kind of movie but um yeah the stx is like you know they they make movies around movie stars with very re- very low budgets and not blumhouse By low level, budgets but like it's what it was yeah yeah like 90s style you know <laughs> movies that that they say they don't make anymore. Uh, that's what STX is doing. Yeah, and of uh, the 26 movies that have been released from their studio, it's it's generated a grand total of $860 million domestically, mm-hmm. which is about the equivalent of what a Marvel movie does worldwide, one Marvel movie. Right. So, uh, but but a, a, according to Adam Fogelman, the, the guy that's running this, uh, he basically was the head of Universal mm-hmm. for, until he came to... Uh, STX, he says that 12 of the last 14 films were profitable, which hmm. is kind of surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, it's a totally different type of model, and I think it, when it works, it works, but uh, we can talk as we, as we discuss the movies that we saw today, or footage from today, about whether or not we think that these films actually have much personality behind them, because um, yeah. for me, a lot of the stuff that they've done so far has been relatively forgettable. Yeah, and we should say their, their biggest hits are like the Bad Moms movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Upside, I Feel Pretty, Den of Thieves, The Gift, Valerian is their number seven biggest film of all time, and that's considered a massive failure. Yeah. So uh, that it, w- I'm not sure what that says about it. <laughs> but um, so far to me, looking at their slate, they've been generally doing very safe stuff, mm-hmm. calculated. They, they, they touted even today that they greenlight films based on statistics and numbers. Like they, they are data-focused. And things like the Bad Moms movies seemed – I've never seen them, so I, I can't comment. But just seeing the marketing for them, they seem very um, – just calculated. Very mm-hmm. calculated to take advantage of a, a certain audience um, that was being underappreciated in cinema. So it's not like you know they're giving content to people. But it seems like it's um, – they're playing for the, dumb, uh, the, the, the lowest common denominator, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I mean I, I think that's fair to say they're they they're taking a broad approach. Uh, none of their movies strike me as particularly um, you know auteur driven or like memorable in that way. Even something like yeah. Molly's Game, which is Aaron Sorkin's directorial debut, was not necessarily like um, you know visually stunning on on the level that you yeah. would expect from a major studio release. But the, the only chances I would say that they've taken thus far is Valerian. I think was a bit of a chance, and yeah. they kind of missed. And um, the Happy Time Murders, I think, I mean, I guess they saw it as like, oh, it's a Melissa McCarthy comedy, but it seemed like it was kind of a uh, out there concept and that didn't quite. I think that movie probably looked a lot better on paper than it ended up being, don't you think? Yeah. Because that that was one of, I remember listening to the podcast that you guys did last year from CinemaCon and they showed some footage from that movie and that seemed to like blow the roof off yeah. the place happy time murders but obviously the film didn't perform yeah. nearly as well as that would indicate it should also be said that the the audience here is made up of movie theater exhibitors mostly from middle america mm-hmm. so the certain things play bigger here like when kevin hart is on stage it's like the biggest thing ever yeah um but I, before we get into what we saw i do want to mention some things that fogelman mentioned that i thought was interesting he said that uh 
eighteen percent of the films they've released were directed by women, and sixty percent featuring women in lead roles. Hmm. That's kind of impressive. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's um, let's talk about I guess the the best of enemies. Should we even talk about that? That's coming out this week. Uh, no, you know, let's people, skip that. Yeah, we yeah, can people, skip that one. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to Pomps. This isn't a movie about Pomeranian uh, dogs. This is a movie about, um, I guess, some people in a reti- some women in a retired community, a retirement community. Yes. Decide to put together a cheerleading, like a club, I think. Squad. Yeah. Squad. Mm-hmm. And then compete against young people at some kind of competition. Or, like. or like maybe uh, draft the young people into helping them. Uh, learn the ropes of cheerleading or something. It stars Diane Keaton, and she actually came out on stage at CinemaCon and talked about how she once auditioned to be a cheerleader. And uh, you know, the, the, it, it's a, it stars a a motley crew of uh, older actresses who o- often yeah. don't get um, the opportunities to be in major movies like this. Pam Greer, Rhea Perlman. Um, it uh, this is coming out on. Uh, Mother's Day, I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and uh, I, you know, seeing this, it seems like this is the movie they're trying to appeal to the people that went and saw Mamma Mia two on opening weekend. Th- mm. That's what it seems like to me. The- I feel like Ben, you and I are both uh, white men of a certain age, and I don't think they're trying. They're, they're not targeting us, right? With this. Yeah, and they, so they don't care about us at all in this particular instance, which is totally fine. It's fine. And, and like yeah. Palms, I think uh, Fogelman also mentioned that um, this movie is supposed to come out in the same weekend uh, during the calendar year that Book Club did last year, and I feel like that's that's a, another sort of comparable thing yeah. if you're looking for you know like a, a comp as they say in the industry yeah. a, a similar type of movie for sure and it, this seems like an uplifting a movie with an uplifting message to me it's, it seems a little artificial and that's maybe something i you'll see a theme today of some of my reactions with yeah a lot of and SCX. like palms is going to be like you know the movie that your mom is going to love basically yeah that, that's who they're aiming for here now the film i think i was probably most impressed with is mm-hmm. a film called 21 bridges this is chadwick boseman who you know plays black panther and in the marvel movies it's produced by the russo brothers and uh this is about uh, he plays a cop in new york city and there is a criminal on the run i'm not sure exactly what the criminal did but he ended up killing a number of police officers and they have to catch him before he gets away. So mm-hmm. they decide to shut down all the 21 bridges outside of Manhattan to close them down, shut down the train routes. And uh, he has a certain amount of time to catch them. So this is kind of like um, Die Hard meets Escape from New York. Or, or it's yeah. something like in, in that vein. I know you're a big Die Hard fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what, what did you think of uh, the, the footage we saw here? Um, I thought it was okay. There's a lot of like, uh, you know, foot chases and hand to hand action and. Uh, you know, shootouts and explosions and stuff like that, the sort of typical stuff you would see from a, a movie like this. But the premise seems like wildly impractical, you know, like shutting down <laughs> the entire uh, island of Manhattan and locking it off. Like, I'm sure there would be so many people that would riot. And, you know, even if they're trying to catch a couple criminals who are responsible for like a drug, bu- uh, you know, uh, some sort of drug I feel deal like it, gone it needs wrong. It to be like a Boston uh, marathon bombing kind of situation. Yes. Like it needs to be that like level of like big, like they didn't right. really go into like what it was. Right. Other than some, you know, so maybe, maybe killed. there's something uh, that they're holding back a little bit in this marketing. But yeah, we saw this first look and uh, Stephen James from uh, if Beale street could talk. And I think he was in uh, the Amazon series homecoming is like the main criminal in this. And so it, any movie that puts Chadwick Boseman, uh, Chadwick Boseman versus Stephen James. I'm going to be at least a little bit interested in, um, but I I don't know. You know, we're talking about movies without a personality. This one just kind of feels like it could fall through the cracks because it doesn't really have that X factor behind it. You know, I, I why were you excited about it? I mean, the action looked highly thrilling, looked intense, but I mean, you are right. This looks like a movie that if you told me if Chadwick Boseman was a star in the 1990s and you told me that this film was from the 90s and they're re-releasing it today yeah. that i would i would totally buy it yeah. the style and everything about it and it totally is one of those films that could have but it's also they don't make movies like this anymore i think 
Like, yeah. they don't make many. Like, I feel like that's what's exciting about it to me. Is and to see and of, Bozeman came out on the stage, and he's producing this movie, too, and that seems like a big deal for him and, like, a sort of a next step in his career. And he talked about partnering with STX and how, you know, they're good partners in terms of, like, letting his producerial <laughs> voice come through and all that. So I think that's, you know, the reason what you just said, people don't make movies like this, is why talent is attracted to SDX is because they're trying to fill a, a gap that yeah. now exists in the current state of Hollywood. Yeah. Um, the next thing that uh, they talked about is Fogelman talked about seeing Guardians of the Galaxy the first time, for the first time and being impressed by Dave Bautista and they had him in for a meeting and they were like, we need to do something with you as a star. And the, the film that, and actually he said that he's going to do more stuff. Like mm-hmm. there's stuff that's in the process of getting signed but the the first thing is a movie called my spy and this basically seems like they're taking the the formula of kindergarten cop the fa- the pacifier game plan mm-hmm. all those movies and applying dave batista and being a spy yeah. to it so they're just swapping batista for schwarzenegger basically yeah. so he's teaching a little kid how to be a spy and it kind of puts you know this big macho strong dude in these vulnerable comedic situations mm-hmm. That puts him, you know, uh, yeah, like, I, I don't know. Uh, these movies have never been my type of movies, and I'm a fan of all these people. Like, mm-hmm. the, the Hogan's, the, you know, The Rock, the, you know, Dave Batista. Right. And this, I mean, these obviously aren't made for me. This is another one that's not, it's being targeted to a much shorter demographic than than us yeah um but what did you think uh i'm sort of right there with you i i sort of like the i like dave batista as a uh, a movie presence uh, as a movie star but i'm not sure that this one's going to be for me there's you know a couple decent jokes in there the, the little girl that they paired him with uh looks very charming and looks like she can hold the screen pretty well and i, I say that as somebody who's normally not a fan of you know <laughs> yeah. child performances in in movies but um you know she makes a joke about how he has taken steroids before and stuff. So it's like, you know, some of those older Schwarzenegger movies, they just don't, nobody ever comments on the fact that he's this huge hulking guy. And it's like so ludicrous that to imagine Schwarzenegger walking around in the world and people not like openly gaping at him because his body is so much bigger than everybody else. So at least they're, they're sort of, um, you know, paying some lip service to the fact that Dave Bautista is like a total beast (laughs) in real life in this movie. For sure. I mean, I like Dave Bautista and I hope, I hope this does well for him in some yeah. way, if it even positions. I feel like guys of that, I mean, it, it does feel like he's trying to follow a career uh, path. Trajectory, yeah. Or, yeah, mm-hmm. that, like, you know, uh, The Rock and Vin yeah. Diesel and those kind of guys took. So, I mean, I guess that's smart play on his behalf yeah. because then you're getting into the life of these children much younger yeah, so that exactly. as they grow up they you grow into the action star that mm-hmm. they yeah yeah um, it's a totally it's a smart move from a, a career perspective for him um let's talk about the boy this is a horror movie that came out of, uh and uh, neither of us saw it Mm-mm. i actually didn't even know it existed to be honest <laughs> with you uh but they made a sequel it, it, it was made for 10 million dollars uh this this original film and it made over 65 million dollars at the box office so this is a that's what they call a huge hit and, and for uh, um, SDX, and um, the sequel is being retitled Brahms, the Boy, numeral two, <laughs> and uh, Kitty Holmes stars as the mother uh, of a well, you know, of the as wife and mother. Her family is moving into this house, which I assume is a house from the first one, yep. and their boy who appears to not speak. Finds this doll. This, I guess it's a possessed doll. Is what it's I about. think that's the premise of the of the first movie. But yeah, like I said, I I haven't seen that one either. But yeah, it looks like the Katie Holmes child digs up Brahms, which is I, as far as we can tell the name of the possessed boy, the the cursed doll kind of uh, character. Yeah. And then it seems like they're. Uh, the Holmes family, Katie Holmes family discovers like this old mansion. Maybe that's where Brahms used to live. Uh, I'm sure that's like you said, that's, that's covered in the first film. But um, what did you think about this? Were you scared at any of this footage? I mean, this is ostensibly a horror movie, but it didn't really seem too scary to me. This seems to me like the typical, like C list horror movie that like Lakeshore is the company that's producing this. And I don't generally like most of what they make. It's not elevated. Like the conjuring, it seems to be, Heavily relying on creepy imagery and jump scares, mm. and and it's um, 
I don't know. It, 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 I haven't seen the first film, so I don't right. plan on seeing this. You? No, I don't think so. This no. is a skip for me. So, so far, this panel, uh, <laughs> I know. really, there, there's not anything that's been impressing us so far. But let's talk about Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman. This was a film that was in development as Tough, tough Guys, T-O-F-F Guys, and Bush. And it has been retitled The Gentleman, which is hard to find because there's other films called The Gentleman on IMDb. <laughs> Um, so good luck with that. But uh, this stars uh, who? Matthew McConaughey, Colin Farrell, uh, Hugh Grant, yep, Charlie Hunnam. It's um, you know as you expect with Guy Ritchie, it has his style. It has um, you know the intense action punctuated by moments of vulgar humor. Mm-hmm. This actually feels much like a return to form for Ritchie. It feels like his older films. Yeah. Um, what, that, what do you think? That's what I wrote down in my notes. A, a return to form for Guy Ritchie. For the people who have been sad to see him go to massive blockbusters, you know, even the Sherlock Holmes movies or, um, you know, he's got Aladdin coming up. He worked on uh, the King Arthur movie not long ago with Charlie Hunnam. Uh, for people who have been disappointed in those efforts, I feel like they're going to be on board for this because this has a much smaller scope, but it definitely has that same vibe and energy as movies like Snatch and Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Yeah. And I'm not sure we said this, but it's a British gangster story, right? Yeah. Of sorts. It, yeah. Actually, the, the trailer that we saw didn't really give us... There, there's, like, drugs and yeah. uh, rival gangs and stuff like that. Henry Golding is in it, too. I don't remember if you mentioned him, but he was no, the, the male lead of Crazy Rich Asians, and um, he looks really great. There's a scene where he sort of faces off with McConaughey and... Um, yeah, I think that, you know, for people who enjoyed the early, uh, output of Guy Ritchie, this is definitely going to be for them. Yeah, I think I'm interested in seeing this. I'm interested in seeing this in the, uh, 21 Bridges movie. Let's, uh, let's talk about the next film. That is The Secret Garden. This is based on the beloved novel. It's from producer David Heyman, who did the Harry Potter franchise, among Mm -hmm. other things, and... They're eyeing this for a spring 2020 release. It's in production now. We got to see a very early trailer. And this is, of course, about an orphan who moves in to live in this kind of huge castle-sized country house. And uh, where boy's sick and uh, the house is kind of dark and decrepit. It w- isn't what it once was. Right. And she discovers a hidden magical garden in the... In like the, the, yeah, in yeah. The, on, the, on the grounds somewhere. Yeah, so uh, the garden looks, you know, the plants bloom in real time, and it's magical, and there's ruins and all sorts of animals, and it's very colorful and beautiful. And, um, I mean, I've seen, I think there's probably like three other movies yes. of this. Uh, I actually just, have one on my DVR right now from like the 1940s or something like that. So I was, I was planning on watching that very soon. I had no idea that they were even making this again. <laughs> and there was a version from the 90s, I think, that I remember seeing when I was a kid, but I only saw it like once or twice. Um, and this one to me, the big difference is what you mentioned, the, the things blooming in real time and like how colorful it is. Yeah. It's so vibrant and like way more, um, yeah, richly textured than any of the other versions that I've seen so far. Uh, and it seems like they're really leaning into like the CG aspect of it, but not in like a what dreams may come kind of way. If yeah. you remember that movie with Robin Williams where like everything was sort of doused in CG, it's just, it seems like a little bit more, um, reasonably handled <laughs> but what, what did you think about this are you are you intrigued by colin firth is in it he plays the uh the sort of uh grumpy the patriarch of this family um, I, I don't know i i i was never a huge fan of this story and I, i've already seen the story told mm-hmm. a couple times before and i'm not sure this kind of colorful beautiful take on it does you know is going to add anything new to it and also the trailer that we saw i'm sure it's probably just something for this convention probably no it it probably looks like something that's going to be it tells the whole story yeah like by the end of the thing i saw exactly what's going to happen right not that i don't already know (laughs) yeah uh what about you yeah i mean i i think i'm a little bit more in the bag for stories of magical forests and kids finding you know secret areas and stuff i I, that's always been a concept that that has sort of stuck with me from childhood stories and things like that so uh i'm intrigued by this i'm i think i'll i'll end up seeing this one I mean, I, I do like concepts like that. And, you know, when this trailer was starting, I thought the pitch for this was like, oh, my God. Like, at first, while it was playing, I was like, oh, David Heyman is – he's going to do world building in this, this secret garden. Like, it's going to be create this whole new kind of world. Mm. And it doesn't quite get there, I think. 
Yeah, it's, and I wonder how much of it is actually, how much of that lush colorization and stuff. Because yeah. from what we've seen, it's like the, the children enter the secret garden and that's where the colors really start to pop. I wonder how much of that is in their imaginations in this yeah. movie or how much of it is actually really happening. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this one does. If people are interested in, in seeing a story that's been told several times before and, and if this is a sort of a timeless kind of thing that that younger audiences are going to take to in 2020 okay so what ended the stx presentation their showstopper their finale is ugly dolls this is the uh animated film adaption of those popular quirky looking stuffed dolls uh that you see around um it is an event adventure story in which uh the free-spirited ugly dolls confront what it means to be different, struggle with the desire to be loved, and ultimately discover who you truly are and what matters most. That's the official synopsis. <laughs> um, and this is directed by the person who did Smurfs The Lost Village, which kind of had a same kind of story to it. Uh, this comes out on May 3rd, 2019. They showed us... Um, well, first of all, they showed us a extended look that featured nine, uh, three of the nine musical numbers. This is being pitched as a comedy and a musical with uh, what Adam called the Ocean's Eleven of musician lineup, mm-hmm. um, which includes Kelly Clarkson, Pitbull. Blake Shelton and Janelle Monet, and yeah, tons of people. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure how much we should go into this or if anybody even cares about this but basically kelly clarkson's character wakes up in this uglyville place where um like she is an ugly doll yeah so yeah she inhabits this land and th- there's all sorts of weird shapes and seams showing in the you know everything looks kind of like in that style and she's always waiting every day for the the human to adopt her mm-hmm. like you know that's her hope and it never happens and uh they somehow decide to escape from Uglyville, and they find the Institute of Perfection, where human childs are paired with their perfect matches, which they are not mm-hmm. perfect, so they never get a match. And there's like a Mean Girls element where the the perfect toys are, you know, uh, voiced by characters like Nick or uh, actors like Nick Jonas, who are, um, you know, the, all of their hairs are in, pro- you know, perfect uh, places, yeah. and they have they dress really slick and everything, and they're sort of horrified at the appearance of these ugly dolls entering their their realm yeah he does a song about um how only pretty dolls will find their perfect match and there's another song about called unbreakable about how there's always going to be someone trying to take you down and you need to show them who you are and (laughs) you know positivity you know i want to hate on this movie uh but the songs are super catchy i think the messaging for this movie is great for children but the film just looks super generic has no real texture <laughs> or personality. The jokes are un, uh, unfunny, even by like you know animated movie outside of Pixar and like you know the elevated kind of stuff mm-hmm. uh, realm. I mean, what did you think? I thought that we were going to be completely on the same page here because you said I don't want to hate on this, and I was like, oh my god, is Peter going to say that he was really into this? And then you sort of turn the page a little bit, but I think. I was surprised by how much I I sort of enjoyed what I saw here. I mean, it's really, really easy to dunk on the concept of an Ugly Dolls movie. And, like, you know, clearly STX, this is their first uh, uh, effort in animation. And they are putting everything they have into this. And they brought Kelly Clarkson out to do a performance at the end of this presentation. Um, Oh, and and they opened announcing they have promotional partners with, like, McDonald's, Walmart. Like, they listed, like, 20 different things. So I think they probably already have their money or, like, enough money back because... Because I'm sure Ugly Dolls, the company, probably has money invested because they're going to make merchandise, right, you know, yeah. the money in merchandising. So I'm sure this is going to be a success yeah, the, financially. The construct around it, all the noise around the movie itself, is sort of easy to laugh at and make fun of a little bit. But I think the actual content of what we saw and, and even what is in some of the trailers and stuff... Like you mentioned, you know, it, it's a really great message for kids. I think the songs are not terrible, and and maybe it's going to be good. I don't know. It's like it feels weird to even say that, but because yeah. and, and they're catchy songs that are you know maybe not on the level of like Lego Movie catchy, but you know that kind of like earworm thing. Yeah, but they're also saying positive messages that like it's not just like. Everything is awesome. You know, right, it's right, like right. actually said something. Yeah, and there's um, nothing subtle about it. 
Yeah. Um, because, <laughs> you know, they, they're like, it, it, everything is so literal in this world. Like, you have these these ugly creatures trying to prove that they're beautiful on the inside. Like, all of these kinds of things. But for kids, like, sometimes subtlety is is lost on them. You know, so, sometimes you you need a sledgehammer approach to, to hammer these messages home. And this might be a good thing for them. I don't know. And, and yeah, I don't know. I, I wonder <laughs> if you think that this could be the beginning of something big for STX in terms of animation. Do you think that because... It does seem like a big swing for them. Yeah. Like, it, it, that can't be cheap. Right. This can't be a mid-budget mm-hmm. movie. I mean, they are account... Like, I feel like, you know, the same way studios get tax breaks and stuff, it seems like all these promotional partners and stuff, that's uh, hedging their bets a little and making this more affordable. But I, it still has to be costly. I, I do not have the estimated budget numbers in front of me. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I didn't think the animation really looked cheap. Um, yeah. So I think, I think it can maybe operate in the same realm. To me, it looks a lot better visually than like some of the Illumination Entertainment stuff. So I, I don't know. Maybe this is the, the beginning of something... Uh, and it's not going for fart jokes and right, stuff right, like exactly. that. It's not lowest common denominator. Like, see, that's why I, I want to embrace about it, but yeah. I feel like also at the same time it doesn't have uh, personality and texture that I want. I don't know. Mm-hmm. They all uh, that's the same thing with all these films. I know I kind of hinted at this in, at the start of this conversation. Is like a lot of these films just seem like very calculated business decisions, and it was always like. We're doing the movie for these reasons, and we need to get this, this, and this in this movie with the, this person, this mm-hmm. person. And it's never creative. Cre- you know, do you know what I mean? The creative yeah. is not spawning, uh, you know, controlling it. It's the business controlling it. And because of that, it all, all feels very artificial to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly feel that. And I wonder how much of that is that we're in a convention for theater owners and maybe they don't care as much about that. And maybe they're, I mean, obviously they're more <laughs> yeah. business focused here because that's what they're here to talk about. Maybe that has something to do with it, but I don't know the, I think <laughs> it'll be interesting to see what the rest of the presentations are like, if they have that same tone where it's, you know, it's not necessarily leaning as much on the creative talent behind it as like, you know, these are the numbers. These are the, these are the reasons why you should be excited about our, our movies coming into your theaters because you're going to make a lot of money this year. Um, I don't know. I, it, it'll be interesting to see if any sort of create creativity slips yeah. through <laughs> for the, the rest of this week. the same company that um, brought Mark Wahlberg and Peter Berg on stage and with Mile 22 to, to, expressing how they're going to cre- create an entire franchise, multi, you know, cross multimedia, and it's going to be, uh, you know, Mark Wahlberg at the time in Transformers saying, this is going to be the biggest thing that I'm I'm going to be remembered for this franchise. Like, he said wow. something like that. Like, wow. there was some kind of comment. Uh, don't, don't quote me there. Yeah, yeah. But he's some kind of comment like that. And, like, I, you know, that was $35 million dollars or something. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I don't want to go back and uh, go through their filmography. We already talked about that. Um, but what, what, what were you most excited about out of this? Um, I mean, I would say probably The Secret Garden. Um, <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, just because I I haven't seen that story in, in a long time, and I feel like maybe it would it could open the door for new generation to sort of discover th- that book and books like it, which I'm always uh, a fan of kids going back to the source material and sort of falling into new magical worlds that way. And then I think maybe The Gentleman, the Guy Ritchie one, yeah. is like my number two of this production. I think uh, the Chadwick Boseman movie, for some reason or other, that I know that's probably not going to be great, but that's <laughs> neat. It's it's the uh, you know this has been that was a very middling presentation for me, and I feel like that kind of floated to the top of mm-hmm. the the middle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you know we're we're here at CinemaCon. It's beginning uh, later. Actually, we're going to be heading right from recording this to the show floor. Where I'm gonna uh, force Ben to eat all sorts of uh, concessions from the future of the cinematic <laughs> experience. We're gonna see what kind of weird technology is there. Pray and for then, me, yeah, listeners. <laughs> yeah, and then um, because Brad couldn't make you here, so you're gonna have to be the test subject because I am on a diet. And uh, after that, we're going to which presentation? Uh, Warner Brothers is having a presentation later tonight. Yeah, so hopefully we'll get some DC stuff there and some you know b- bigger uh, films that you know. Our listeners and readers are interested. And tomorrow we are doing Disney and Universal, I think. Yes, I think that's right. And then the next day is Paramount. Yes. So look forward to coverage of all those on the podcast and on the site. As always, you can follow us 
on SlashFilm.com. I'm at SlashFilm on all social media. Where can we find you? I am on Twitter and Instagram at Ben Pears. Yes, and we are doing Instagram and Instagram stories from this convention, so please follow us. You can find this podcast, SlashFilm Daily, published every weekday on all the popular podcast apps. And uh, please head on over to iTunes page, give us a five-star rating, write us a little review, and we will see you on the next episode.